Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to do this with you today. Um, you will notice I am doing this from my home kitchen. Um, it is very, very hot today. Um, and so I, I did decide I was going to do this outside, which is a much better place to do this because it can be very messy. Um, but we are going to do it inside just uh, for my own health, I think. Um, we have right here in Rhode Island, we have air quality alerts and um, we're just going to adapt and we're going to make it work and I think it'll be great. Um, so just a little bit about fish skin tanning. Indigenous populations around the world have been tanning fish skins for thousands of years. Fish leather is actually incredibly durable. It's, it's quite different than um, deer skin leather or cow leather or pig leather. It has a really interesting um, layering when you look at the fibers and how the fish skin comes together. I have a couple examples here of recently tanned salmon skin. And so I will be using this to make moccasins for my four-year-old. I'll, I'll use it to make the moccasin flaps. Um, but this is, this is Atlantic salmon skin. Uh, you can use many different types of uh, fish skin. And if you look very closely at the back, and I'll move it up here, there's almost a cross hatching pattern of these hairs. Um, and if you can keep trying to pull the hairs and pull them off and pull them off, and you will, you will just continue to wear away at these fibers. This is how the fish is made. This is how the fish is built. Um, and it really is quite soft and supple. Um, and also waterproof, of course, because it is a fish. Um, but you can see it has beautiful gold flecking here. And the reason why it is this dark, dark brown color, if you think of salmon skin, you tend to think of a nice silvery color. Um, it's the tea tanning process. So that's what we will be doing today is tea tanning. Um, and I will be demonstrate, demonstrating how we do that. I'll also be demonstrating how you clean a fish. But people have been using fish skins to make clothing, to make jackets, to make pants. Um, think about your water gear, like your Helly Hansen fully waterproof gear um, of our ancestors. Fish skin tanning is uh, making its comeback among many different indigenous communities. It was um, it, it was sleeping for a while, depending on where you are, especially here in the Northeast. A lot of what we um, have encountered over the past 400 years is the decline in fish populations. Um, and with the decline in fish populations, we also look at uh, the decline in the sizes and the health of the fish. And so, um, early colonists noted that we did have fish skin or fish leather clothing here in Southern New England and in other areas of the New England region. Um, but as these fish populations were decimated, uh, of course, the, the practice of fish skin tanning and wearing fish skins for clothing was negatively affected. Um, I know that it is, uh, also making a comeback, and I, I shouldn't say making a comeback, it, um, it stayed as a tradition that has been continued through the generations in Alaska by different Alaska Native communities, um, and it's gaining more and more popularity. And so I learned fish skin tanning through Amber Sandy, who is um, a, a Diné fish skin tanner, um, in the, I think, Northwest Territories or in Alaska. Um, and so she actually had this whole online tutorial of how to tan fish skins. There are other folks who I have um, followed and learned from, but this particular technique I learned uh, from Amber. And so I am really excited to share this with y'all today and um, before we begin, I just want to give you an overview of some of the tools that I have um, before I haul this big fish from my cooler here right onto the table. So I have clean, cold water. We will not be using any hot water today. 
Um, this is clean, cold water. And I also have some um, blue Dawn. I guess you could use palm olive, but we use Dawn in my house, um, which is really great for removing the oils. Uh, if you think about what, um, when there's an oil spill, you always use blue Dawn, right? That's um, to, to clean off the, the animals from the oil spill. That's what we'll be using. Um, I also have black tea, which has tannins in it. And this is what's going to um, tan our skin. This is a multi-day process. And I'm only just showing you small stages of this. I also have bear grease right here. Um, this is rendered bear fat and some saddle soap. So this, these two things get used once you have um, tanned your skin. And uh, today I'm showing you the beginning processes of tanning skin, but the end processes of tanning skin really is just taking this bear grease and it directly into the skin on both sides until it is all absorbed. And then I like to use saddle soap um, to then get that final shiny coat um, that makes it soft and supple. So if you were to watch this process, all you would be watching is me rubbing it in. Um, it's not the most involved part of the process, but this occurs after about five to seven days of the skin staying in the tea tanning solution. So I'm going to move these things off the table because we need to put our fish up here. I also have paper towels um, because this can be messy and off camera. I also have baby wipes um, because again, it can be messy. Some of the tools that I'm going to use, I will primarily be using my um, fillet knife and I also have a fish scaling tool. If you do not have a fish scaling tool, you can use um, either, uh, you can use the back of a butter knife um, and then we can also use a spoon to remove some of the um, some of the meat in the in the fat off of the back of the skin. I'm going to move these right over here, and just of course a towel um, for easy cleanup, but also it'll help me with the grip. And I'm going to move my nice clean fish skin right back. Okay. So what we're tanning today is my favorite fish to eat. It's striped bass. And I'm joking, I feel like Julia Child here. <laughs> so we have a large, very large. Twenty pound fish. <laughs> this is a striped bass. I got um last night. I um I already removed the insides of this fish because when you, we will also be consuming this fish once we remove the skin. Um, but this is a beautiful, beautiful fish. Um, it's about 20 pounds and it has its scales. It has the, uh, the different fins, the pectoral fin, the dorsal fin. Um, and when you work with fish and you tan fish, you want to be, um, or just when you gut and clean fish, you want to be very careful because their bones, um, it, especially in these fins, they hurt a lot. Uh, you can actually get really bad infections. They're like needles and they'll go right into your skin. Um, but it's mainly these, fin, these fins right here, these back ones, it's a little softer, but still you always have to be very, very careful. Um, so after this fish was caught, it was iced right away and um, it was gutted within 24 hours. Uh, like with any animal, if you've ever process, processed an animal, uh, you want to remove the innards right away because that's where the decay will begin um, if you want to be eating your, your fish um, or if you want to be eating your deer or your buffalo or your cow or anything like that, it has to be gutted right away. So um, I took the time last night to gut the animal. Um, and so we, are, uh, you can see the inside, uh-oh. Sorry, I got a little notice, notice on my phone. Um, so you can see the inside, it's all cleaned out. I've removed um, 
I did not remove the heels because we'll be um, removing the head and we're just going to be using um, all of this beautiful skin. But before I start taking this apart, we're going to be uh, starting with this messy part of, um, of cleaning the fish, um, which is removing the scales. So you can see just how large the scales are. The scales are a nice protective coating. Um, they are beautiful. Different types of ant, uh, fish will have different shaped scales and many communities will use them in jewelry. So gar scales, for example, which are the large ancient fish um, and they're mostly down South American gar, they, um, they make jewelry out of them. I actually have a pair of earrings. So this is where it gets quite messy. I'm just going to take my fish scaler, but I'm going to be very careful as I do this because um, we want to keep this beautiful skin intact underneath. We don't want, that's why I'm not going at it with a knife. Um, I just want to be very, very careful about removing these scales. I'll start at the tail and work all the way up. So you'll start seeing scales flying everywhere. This is okay. We're, we're used to a lot of um, this kind of processing in my house. Um, my husband's a fisherman, uh, not by trade, but uh, we do a lot of subsistence harvesting and we do a lot of subsistence fishing and growing um, and hunting in my house. So there's always something going on, always something going into my freezer. And so as I am moving the scales, I'm going against the grain. Uh, if I just go with the grain, it's not going to do anything. I have to go against the grain. And normally if I was to scale this for eating and not for, um, not for the skin, I would go very quickly and probably not, um, not be so gentle with it. But I do not, I do want to keep the skin intact. I don't want any holes or rips. I don't want to compromise it in any way. So for thousands and thousands of years, indigenous people here in Southern New England have been relying upon the ocean um, to sustain us in many different ways. Um, fish were not the only things that were consumed, the only things that were consumed out of the ocean. Uh, whales were also consumed, uh, harpooned and consumed prior to European arrival. Uh, when you had something like a whale wash up on shore, uh, it becomes a, a great community event. Also other marine mammals such as seals were hunted. And if you think of um, all the different things you can do with seal, think about clothing. You also think about the seal meat, the seal, uh, uh, the seal fat being used as well. Um, just this past weekend, um, I hosted a community clam bake and we talked a lot. It was a clam bake workshop where we taught people how to um, forage and harvest the bounties of the sea. So other types of marine life that was harvested include seaweed and many different types of seaweed. Some of it was used for food and others, uh, other types of seaweed, like what we gathered, which was rock weed, was used for, um, was used for steaming the plant base. And um, also lobsters, crabs, uh, we foraged and harvested cohogs and mussels and the, inv and the invasive periwinkle. Um, and so these are just different things that we can get today as modern people, but these are only some of the, the bounties of the sea. Uh, of course, like I said before, um, due to pollution due to um, colonial laws that then turned into uh, state and federal laws that permit the taking of certain types of animals um, 
of certain types of species of fish, we have unfortunately lost a lot of um, a lot of our ability to go out and harvest these things and also to to use them in ways that we would think as modern Americans are unconventional, such as um, such as for clothing. Um, you know, we, we as Americans tend to think fish is for eating and maybe occasionally for trophy making, depending on um, if that's your aesthetic. But your people, we look at fish as our relatives. We look at them as great providers. They have given their life so that we can eat. And so we are respectful of these great beings. This is a relatively small striped bass. This one's only 20 pounds. And um, they are much bigger. I was actually offered a 50 pound striped bass. So imagine that. That would be wonderful for um, fish skin canning to get a lot of mileage out of that one fish. But I went with something a little more manageable. So this is 20 pounder. And one day I probably will, uh, once I start really taking up foil tanning, which is a completely different process uh, that I'm not as familiar with. I ended up signing up for some digital Zoom classes for oil tanning over um, in the early spring. Once I pick up oil tanning, I will likely then start oil tanning um, these straight bass skins because they are so beautiful. But when you oil tan, it does not impart any color. And so um, you can use different plant dyes to then create different colors. I choose fish skins that are tanned blue and green and pink. They're absolutely gorgeous. We're just starting with um, a tea tan today for the simplicity of it. So you can see, um, I've come up to the crawler of the fish right here. Uh, we still have a few scales left. Um, then I have to flip it over and do the other side. But it is kind of a messy process. This is definitely something to do outside if you can do it outside. Um, but again, just because it's quite hot and uncomfortable, I just figured, sorry, I'd rather clean my kitchen than be outside and not be able to breathe. So I'm going up right to the head here because this is right behind the gill area is where I'm going to be cut it. And so I, as I run my hands along it very carefully, especially by the fins, um, you can see that these scales have come off. It's nice and soft and smooth. If we were in person, it would be great. Everybody would be able to touch it and you could feel the difference. You've never scaled a fish before. But likely I will still have some scales, especially around the belly area um, to pull off once I remove it from the fish. All right. But also by gutting it last night, um, we saved about 15 minutes of processing time here on the program. All right. So we'll go to this side. What I'm going to do is I will pull up the chat feature because if uh, people have questions, just pop them right in the chat. But again, I'm also doing this side here. So fish secrete, um, they, they secrete kind of a slime, I'm actually not quite sure what it is um, called, but it, they secrete it constantly, but you don't really notice it while they're in the water. But after, um, after they die, they continue to secrete this, and that's why um, fish have this slimy texture to them. Um, and that is what we are going to be removing in the water with the dawn. Um, so 
might think, oh, this is a smelly process, right? Because what will happen is once we leave the fish, well, once we put the fish in into the canning solution, it's going to stay on the counter. I'm not sticking it in my refrigerator and it's not smelly. I promise you it's not smelly. It doesn't get gross. Um, it is, it's fine. It's just like leaving a glass of tea on the counter for a few days. Um, because what will happen is every day we're going to add more tea. And so once I get the, once I get the skin off, I'll show you. I have pre-mixed a canning solution of five large bags of black tea in about two liters of water. Uh, or I'm sorry, no. Uh, it's usually one liter of water to five bags of tea. I have um, about nine or 10 bags right now of tea in two liters of water. Um, so I made the tea, I'm pulling it down. It's not going in a hot solution, it's going in a cold solution. Um, because what will happen is if you use hot water on any of the skin, it's going to cause it to shrink and you're going to ruin it. So I have to be really careful here around these dorsal fins because these will come up and prick me. Um, that happened to me last summer and it was awful. <laughs> I actually got the bone stuck in me um, and that was very uncomfortable. So you have to be very, very careful when processing fish. Um, so the tanning solution, you don't want to start with too many bags of tea because if you start with too many bags, you will over, um, over saturate and um, you'll get, I think it's called a dead tan, which is when you have, um, which is when you have too many tannins. And so when you have too many tannins, it will cause your skin to just really stiffen up on you and you won't get that soft, supple skin. Um, and so we will gradually add more tea bags every day. So we'll, uh, we'll double our tea bags every day. So today we're gonna start with um, 10 tea bags. And then tomorrow I will be adding, um, cause it's a larger solution. So tomorrow I will go with uh, 15 tea bags and then I'll go with 20 tea bags. And then I'll go in increments of five rather than double. I'll go in increments of five. And after about five to seven days of doing increments of five, um, we'll be able to see that the tea, um, that the tannins have been absorbed. And when that's ready, we take it out and rinse it. We rinse the excess tannins out until it washes clear, again, under cold water. And we'll lay it out on a towel to dry. And um, that's when we can add the, the bear grease and the bear fat. And we can massage it in. So it's a really simple process. But the key in taking care of um, the, the increment, the key is being careful about the increments of tea that you add and stirring it every day. That's why I keep it on the kitchen counter because if I keep it right in the middle of my kitchen counter, every time I walk by, I stir that solution. Just a couple of rotations just around. And that's what keeps it moving and keeps the, the tea from, um, from settling, right? It keeps the it keeps it moving and getting pushed into the skin. So I'm almost at the end of the scaling process here. This is where I have those tough scales right up around the gill line. I see there's a question here and you're gonna to have to forgive me for getting so close because I can't see very well. Um, but, uh, oh, great, thank you. Um, it definitely is a really cool process. Um, 
I really, really enjoy doing this. Um, and it is a great way to get into animal skin tanning um, if you're newer to it. Um, tanning a whole deer is exhausting and it's a lot of work and it's a good community project, but if you don't necessarily know what you're doing, it's not something to really tackle alone. I'm always impressed by the people who just read about it and then they can just do it. Um, I like to learn directly from people. I like to learn directly from elders or knowledge keepers, culture bearers. Um, those are the folks who, it's just my practice of learning, but um, you know, people who can read about things and just do them, it, it's quite impressive. Um, but fish skin tanning, is not the hardest. And you can also start with a very small fish. Um, and what you can do is anytime you get fish from the grocery uh, store, to the supermarket, you can just remove the skin when you get home and plop it in your freezer until you have a few skins that you're ready. You don't have to take on a whole fish like that. Now, of course, you can my favorite fish to eat. So, Anytime I can get striped bass, that's of a good size, um, you know, I try to save that skin and try to eat it, or rather try to eat the fish um, and save that skin. But if you just go and get some salmon, that's probably, I'd say, one of the easiest ones because salmon is so fatty. The, um, the, the skin will separate nice and easily. Let's freeze this. I have a frozen, I have a small sea bass skin here um, that I thawed out of the freezer. And I'll probably just add it to the sea tanning solution. More belly, tail, and then we can start the skinning process which is a little more challenging than this. This is kind of mindless work. But it's great to give information while I work. I love doing programs like this, um, very hands-on active programs. So you can see, we have now removed these scales and you can just see how beautiful the skin is. I wish you were here to see it in person and maybe in the future we can do something like this in person but it's absolutely lovely it's beautiful the fish maintains its color underneath all these scales i mean these scales are pretty transparent and you can go online and look in different museum collections um for historical examples of fish skin clothing, or you can look to modern indigenous artists. Um, again, this was practiced in different parts of the world, so not just in Native North America. But of course, um, that is my own tradition. And we're going with some more contemporary Native North American techniques. I couldn't tell you what other cultures do, but all right. So we have tanned our fish skin. I am trying to kind of clean up the best I can here. And you can see this. I have a great pile of scales. These scales are just easy to go with them. I'm not going to do anything with them, but. So other parts of this fish, um, so I saved other parts of this fish for fertilizer. So when I got the fish last night, um, it got saved in a bucket. We add water to it and um, we let it ferment a little bit. Uh, you can also, you can put it in the blender and make kind of a fish, fish smoothie and then put it uh, just in a five gallon bucket and you let it ferment and then um, I'll, gradually add it to um, my garden sprayer because the nitrogen is 
what really helps a lot of your crops. So in my garden, I currently have uh, traditional, um, I have Metacom's corn, uh, or King Phillips corn, which is a traditional variety, Wampanoag variety that was given to my family. Um, corn craves nitrogen, and nothing is better than um, fish nitrogen. And so traditionally, Native people here in southern New England would take um, herring or menhaden or other types of small fish, or they would take uh, refuse from larger fish like this, and they would put put it right into um, some water and use, or right into the corn mounds. So what I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to get a larger knife, um, but uh, I'm going to cut here. See, also, once you scale it, it's so much easier to cut. So I'm going right here behind the collar and it's kind of hard to see move up like this. I'm going to cut here and that way. Um, because I'm also, I'm going right behind the gills, trying to go under the, the hard, heavy scales that I couldn't get off, right to the head. Slightly bigger knife here. It's quite a bit, it's a large fish. And there we go. that's annoying. Um, I think that was from Crocodile Dundee, which is a great and terrible movie that I love. Um, and so I just go right up behind um, the gills, just kind of a, a pressure motion nice and sharp and carefully some of these scales off covered in scales the thing about scales is they, because they have the slime what will also happen is uh, they will stick to things um, people would make fish glue and um, it's very effective. So again, we're going to go behind this pectoral fin, trying to find where my scales are so they can get off. Try to keep your hands out of the way. Met up with my other cut there. I prefer the smaller knife. It's a little more, um, you have more control when it's smaller, but it doesn't always uh, work out because there's bones, tendons that you have to get through. And this is true with any type of, um, so I, I missed my cut here, so I'll just try to even it out. So the hardest part is here's the spine across the back um, and cutting right through that that bone. But if you can find the joint where the cartilage is between the bones, it's not too bad. Fork it. Um, if you are new to processing fish, I suggest starting with something small. <laughs> like a scup or a small tatog or you can even buy it's it's amazing um you can buy striped bass now um you can buy striped bass um, at the grocery store but instead of getting these big ones they farm raise them 
So just trying to. So it's a little interesting to see inside here, but we need to get through this this thick thick spine, um, which is about I would say as wide as a nickel. So I'm just looking for that joint in the bone here. I'm not afraid to get there. It is cartilage. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. This is usually where I have my husband to do this because it just takes a little bit extra of extra strength. There we go. removed, okay. which is going back into my cooler right here, because after I'm, after we do this, I, um, and I'll do it off camera, um, there's very delicious meat in the head called the cheek meat, quite literally the fish cheeks, and if I had to compare it to anything, it would be like scallops, these nice little round pieces. So um, I'm going to be removing the fins um, because we don't need them. These will go into my fish fertilizer and just kind of follow the cut of the bone here. The other side, pectoral fins. And I'm not as worried about taking the skin from this area. Um, it's okay if I remove some of it. Doing a quick here as well. Find those bones. Some people use scissors or pliers. Here I'm going to use my, my cloth because it is slippery. Helps to get a better grip. Right along here. Over. Um, Leah, we had a, a question come in. If this is a good moment, sure. That is a this is a wonderful moment. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, when was the first time that you processed a fish, and if you're okay sharing, uh. Who, who may have taught you? Sure, um, I was about 11 maybe, um, when I learned to process my first fish, um, my dad always fished. And so um, he always taught me life skills, um, kind of always had to get my academic skills from my mom and my life skills from my dad. And, um, so I started learning to, to process different animals around that age. Um, I really enjoy doing it. It's just a really good, important way of connecting with the land. And I just have really good memories of doing stuff like that. Um, I'm just removing a couple of these belly scales here. Now that it's a little easier. What I'm going to do is at that was um, so at the very end, I'm just going to cut a notch. Um, 
I'm not going to cut through the meat or through the bone, but I just want to cut a couple of notches here. And these notches are going to be um, to grab the skin. So like with most animals, um, you want to separate the membrane from the flesh. And once you can get a good initial grip, then it's going to be a lot easier. I prefer to just peel the skin right off. But I need to have a grip that's, that's good enough. I also don't want any holes to form in the skin. So this is pretty crucial over here. I'm just taking my knife and separating that flesh. So I'm not going to take this off as in one foul suit because I have to admit, I am not that talented. Um, so I'm going to start cutting the skin like I normally would when I'm filleting the fish. So I've gotten most of my scales off the back. And so I'm just making a nice horizontal cut along the back bone. Along the Oops, along these back fins. And do my best to make it neat. Always sharpen your knives. Keep your, um, your fish knives very sharp because if they are not, they uh, can cut you. A dull knife is way worse. There we go. All right, so I have now broken through the skin all the way. And I'll just continue all the way back here too. Bring that little fin. Just about there. Okay. So now I'm just going to pull off the skin and some of the meat will come with it and that's fine because I will clean up and save the meat. So you can see um, it's nice and red here. This is just the muscle of the fish. Um, and when you eat fish like bluefish or, um, or striped bass, this is usually the meat you don't want to eat. Um, it's where the mercury is contained. It also is where you get taste from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do this one side of the fish and then um, I will do the other, I will process the other side later. That way you can see the tea tanning solution and how I remove, um, how I remove the rest of this membrane here. So this is, I think, the challenging part. Um, because it's just, it's very slippery. But it does come right off. I have to say, I think salmon skin is the easiest because salmon skin, it has so much fat. 
it just peels right off like a banana. Straight bass, they are more mus muscular, in my opinion. Um, I believe the word is manakeke, which means he's very strong. And that makes a lot of sense for these fish. So we're almost there. Trying not to take too much of this meat with me. There we go. Or make holes. That part. Almost there. And I think the most beautiful skin is right over here. So I'm going to try to be pretty careful about this section. But it's coming up much easier. Almost there. You can also cut fillets um, and, and basically do it off the fillets, which is what some people do. Um, I try to get it in the biggest chunks I can. And sometimes filleting the fish, you lose the chunks of skin. So as I'm going through, I'm just trying to make the cuts necessary to free it up right against the meat. And I apologize if my head is in the screen, but I'm trying to get that good grip. There we go. Last bit. The, the collar, I guess collarbone is not quite sure what uh what bone this is. All right, so we have our piece of skin that we have to clean up now. And I'm going to take the rest of my fish, fish pieces, right on my cooler. Okay, this will be good eats later. Barely sits in my cooler. Okay. So now what we can do is I'll take my spoon. Well, I'll also take some of this meat. I can just pull it right off. And save this meat for later. Straight bass meat, in my opinion, it's the best fish tacos. Um and remove, like I have a bone here. That's a hazard. Okay. So this red part is generally the, the piece that many folks throw away because again, that's where your mercury content, um, where your heavy metal content lives in larger fish. Um, and if you look on this side, it's fairly clean. Right, got a little hole there that I that I um that I grabbed by accident. So I'm just grabbing oh my spoon, and I'm going to use the opportunity to just take my spoon. And a spoon is really good to get all of this meat off um, because it's not going to rip through like a knife wood. And we just grab your fish and just break it right off. This is all really good to eat up with your soup or fish cakes. So I'm going to save all this white meat here. Good meat I'm not as concerned about. So you all are getting a two for one program deal because it's not just 
fish skin tanning. You're learning about processing fish, and what to do with the striped bass. In fact, uh, I, I would suggest if you want to eat striped bass, it's always a rewarding going out to catch them by yourself um, or with a group of friends, maybe on a charter. But um, you can also go to your local fishmonger. I would suggest a fish market uh, as opposed to just the grocery store because you get more local varieties. And if you're not here from New England, of course, you can try this with any kind of fish. So I'm just removing this excess meat here. And you want to get as much of this meat that membrane off as possible because that is what will go rotten, not the skin itself. It's like with anything, you want to remove all that membrane. See this, this gray kind of shiny stuff with that membrane? So um, we are coming right up to 1 p.m. and I know some folks have to jump off to go to other meetings. Um, Leah, do you want to um, share what the next steps would be for the process? And if folks Absolutely. can stay on, they can. Absolutely. So after I remove all of this membrane, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put about three pumps of, or three, I'll do about three tablespoons or three teaspoons rather, one tablespoon of um, Dawn dish, dish soap in some cold water. And I'm just going to swish the skin around. And so swishing the skin around and um, rinsing, washing it rather, um, and rinsing it, that will, um, that will remove these oils that we don't want because the oils, again, just like the membrane and the meat, that's what's going to ruin your tanning process and make everything um, rot. So once you get this nice white, um, white skin, that's where you can put it right in this Dawn water. I rinse it and I wring it out and then I just am going to put it in my black teaspoon solution, which I'm going to grab quickly so you can see what it looks like by coloration. So I have it right here. This is my tea solution. It's got about nine tea bags in it, 10 tea bags in it. And I will put the fish right into it. And I'll take a wooden spoon and I'll stir it around really good for a couple of minutes. And then I will just leave it on the counter. Um, and every day I'm going, every time I walk by it, I'm going to stir it. But every time I um, get up in the morning, as I make my coffee, I will make a pot of tea and just add more tea bags. And I will take the fish skin out of the existing pot solution. And I'll just put it in the new, uh, new pot of room temperature, room temperature, um, solution. Again, you can't do it in the heat because it will turn into, um, it, it will, it will just ruin your, your skin. Thank you so much. Well, um, as we are wrapping up, if folks have any questions for Leah about this a fish skin tanning process. This is a great time to ask. You can either raise your hand or since we're a pretty small group, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and if there are no questions, we look forward to seeing you all at the next Earth, Sea and Sky program, um, which you can again find more information about uh, at the museum's uh, events page, which I am linking in the chat. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. And again, if you have any questions, now is a great time.
can't see too far into the chat. So um, feel free, just unmute yourself. Um, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. And you can stay on for a little bit longer. I'm almost ready to just get this into the water. I just have these little bits left. Canning is a fairly involved process. It's not something that we can just do in 15 minutes or 25 minutes. Um, depending on what you're doing, it takes hours. You thought I only did half of the skin here. Um, you know, I, I still have the other half to complete afterwards too. It's all prepping the skin before your solution. Soaking things in the solution, I think to any type of tanning is the easiest part. The part that I find challenging and laboring is this scraping. And this is true with um, fish skin. This is true with mammal skin. Um, it's quite, quite involved. Um, but the end result is always gorgeous. You do it right. And what we'll do is once this is all tanned, um, I will photograph of um, the finished product and we will email them out to everyone. So you can see just with the finished straight fast project. Almost done here. So with this straight pass, and I probably um, will get a few more skins together and I will, um, I'll sew them together. I think I'd like to make um, a purse or a bag um, for traditional clothing. So I have it in my head that I'll have a few more of these by the end of the summer and I'll sew them together and probably add some beadwork detailing and make a bandolier bag, which I will probably end up either giving away or using using myself, um, or yeah, I will answer them in the art show. I'm not exactly sure. Yet. I really enjoy doing this. I love connecting to the ocean. I love connecting to the land. Um, and so the, all the gifts that fish can offer, I think people really overlook fish because they're good for eating, but they're good for so many things. We um, really need to protect them. Um, fish are often over harvested. And um, something that if we don't practice sustainable fishing, we are not going to have these beings for the next generation. Which is already unsustainable harvest in many places, in many different ways. And farming is not a better solution. Um, fish farms can actually be quite damaging. Um, to the environment. And some fish end up where they shouldn't. Um, Atlantic salmon, which are much larger fish um, than the Pacific varieties, they're more aggressive. They have escaped from uh, West Coast uh, fisher, uh, not fisheries, West Coast um, farms. And now they are out competing the original salmon and causing environmental damage there. And they were never meant to be there. They are our true fish here from the Northeast, which 
were so, their populations were so damaged due to the damming in industrial, um, industrial revolution here in New England that we have very, very small populations and very protected populations of wild Atlantic salmon here um, along the waters of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, but these fish were so plentiful, it was said that the that they were so plentiful in the 1600s that the colonists remarked that you could walk upon their backs across the river when they were running. Now we have decimated these populations to the point where you're not allowed to fish for them. They are only grown and harvested um, by, uh, by fish farms. And the last of this membrane off here, but you can see I've removed all of the meat. But this membrane definitely has to come off. It doesn't seem like a lot, um, but if I do not get it off, um, again, it will ruin my solution. Just taking off, there's a bone here. I missed, but here we go. It's a neat moment. And what I might end up doing is just washing my skin and seeing how it comes, comes out, washing it and rinsing it um, and saying, oh, I still see some membrane. And then I will remove that. It's a little tougher near the tail because um, uh, their tails are, are so strong and you can really help them. It's a little, a little more challenging. But there are different tools that you can use to try this. The spoon really is the best. I'm going to just move whatever direction I need to. Right hand is always the And it's always more difficult near the edges because there's the The only place where there's membrane left is along these two edges for the most part. But this is very dark. This is a great activity to do when you have multiple people because when your arm starts getting tired, like mine is, you have the next person. Just going to trim a little bit around this belly meat here. It's really thin in this area, but it will tan fairly well. So here's your skin. I feel I have a few more scales. Definitely the scales have to come off over every section, otherwise the, um, the
the tanning solution will not sink in. So here's my bowl of cold, clean water. Just adding a few. I use a pump bottle. Also nice to kind of wash my hands in the solution. Go a little more. We want it nice and bubbly. And just take my skin and just move it around just like you're washing your delicates. And scrubbing it. And you can see just how clean and white that is. But if you notice, there is some membrane that I missed. So I will probably go back and scrape it more of that. I'm using the opportunity to peel for scales. And as we, we put it in the tea tanning solution, after about two days, the skin will appear thicker. And um, once it gets to a very consistent thickness and color, um, that's when we'll remove it. So for something this large, about five days, five, maybe seven days, it takes the time that it takes. There is no perfect formula. You can see it's nice and uh, bubbly here. All right, so let's, let's take a look at what we have here. So you have this nice, beautiful color and stripes, striations here. And on the other side, we have a little bit of membrane and fat left that I have to scrape off before it can go into my tanning solution. But this is what we want it to look like, just nice and clean, like in this area here. I'll scrub it a few more times. I'll also, as it sits in there for a couple minutes, I'll use this opportunity to Kind of clear the decks a bit. The material, this fish material. Again, it gets all saved for the garden at my house. So we try to use the different parts of the fish. I'll even use these parts too because they've been sitting out. Right, so now I take this out. I'm just going to wring it out a little bit. Let's assess. It's nice and smooth on this side. Um, I don't think I have any more scales. You can kind of tell because they're so hard. But this side, we still have a little bit of that membrane left. I think I'm going to just grab very quickly a different spoon. Any more? a better edge to it. Still want to cut just to get the silver. Silver kind of helps too. So we can break down those fats in between. Oh, 
owner and he definitely loves fish. It's pretty much his, one of his favorite meals. I think salmon is his favorite. Striped bass is not as big of a fan of. So um, over this summer, as my family continues to harvest um, different fish, we harvest the frog, we harvest the blue fish, we harvest um, striped bass, black sea bass, I will not be tanning all the skin of all of the fish that we harvest, especially for the smaller ones, which is more difficult. Um, and the yield is not as worth it. One. Here's an example of a black sea bath. This will go in my tanning solution. This is one little fish. <laughs> you can see just how small it is, but it has a beautiful pattern and beautiful color. So I will be washing this um, and then I'm just going to stick it. Why don't I do that now? Little Julia Child tricks. This has already been scraped. To wash it. Some cleaner soap. Okay. Nice and clean. And I don't really even need to rinse it. It can just, um, it can go right, kind of just wiped off. You can see this was with from one singular fish. And that membrane has come off. It's nice and clean. I'm just going to take a paper towel to wipe off the excess water. And I'll do this. I'll just take it like that and roll it. And when I take it out of the solution, I also roll it. Just to get that excess soap off. But the soap is not going to be a problem for your tanning solution. And there you go ready to go right in our solution. And every time I, I'll grab a wooden spoon and every time I walk by, I will just stir it up, get it moving, get it active. So it's going to lose this beautiful black and white coloration here, but it will maintain the patterning, but wherever it's white, it will turn a nice brown color. So I just stir it. And that's uh, black sea bass. And so it's just going to sit on the counter for a few days. So what I've done is I have changed my tea in my jar multiple times, about five or six days worth, um, increasing the tea bags by increments of five tea bags per day. So if you remember, we started out with five tea bags and then the next day we did 10 tea bags and then we did 15 tea bags and then we did 20 tea bags and I left it um, in 20 tea bags, uh, changing those tea bags every night for about uh, 
two to three more days. And then what happened was the water or the tea rather, the solution started changing from a murky color to a clear color. And what you want to look for is a very consistent color in your skins because you've been stirring it. Every time I walked by, I would stir, 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 and that really jostles it up nicely. So I took the tea, or I took the skins out of the, the tea solution and squeezed them out really well. And I have a nice consistent color throughout. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them into some dish soap and cool water. Again, we're using only cool water and cool tea solution throughout this. Otherwise you're going to um, shrink or disintegrate your skins. So I have the sea bass skins and also I have a couple of little black sea bass. They're a bit different than striped bass here. Pretty skins. And I'm just putting them right into my soap and water and just giving them a quick wash in here. Squeezing them out, squeezing the excess tanning solution out of them. And what this is going to do is it's going to uh, reopen up those pores so that the oil can then be absorbed right into the skin. So you can see, if I can move all these bubbles here, kind of this darker solution or this darker soap from the solution. I'm just squeezing them. What I did not mention when we first had the session was putting or adding some salt into that initial tanning solution to help cut the bacteria. So I left this mason jar out on my counter. I did not put it in the refrigerator. I did not um, cover it. It had no smell whatsoever because we initially washed the skins like I am now. We rinsed the skins and then we put them right into the tanning solution that had a bit of salt. You don't have to put the salt in every single time. It's just that first time to cut down on that bacteria. So if you walked by and you sniffed the jar, which I did periodically, um, just to double check, if you scraped the skins well enough, then you will have no smell. It'll just smell like black tea, Lipton black tea or red rose, um, I used my store brand, just inexpensive black tea. So I'm really just squeezing this out. All right. So this is a multi-day process. This is not just something that can be done in a couple hours or in an afternoon, but we have a nice skin color here. Looks just like any other type of leather. So now what I'm going to do is take a towel and I suggest using a darker towel. and you take it right out of your tanning solution, or excuse me, your soapy solution, <laughs> and you squeeze it out well. Try not to wring it out, but just squeeze it. Get all that extra soapy water out. And we don't even have to rinse this. This is fine. I did not put much soap in there. And you lay your skins out right on the towel. But you can see how nice they are. Now you see all these hairs and these membranes. These will get taken care of when um, we get to the next phase. But turning it over, you can see the beautiful 
patterning of the striped bass right in here. And I just want to show for size comparison, the black sea bass and the pattern comparison too. So I may use, I will use these for different projects. So these are two different species of Atlantic fish here. And you can see just how beautiful they are. They really absorb the color well while maintaining their original patterning of the darker colors. You can see the other side. This is a much thinner skin, much finer. I will probably use this for earrings. And this thicker one I'll use for larger projects. So what I'm going to do is just turn the skins over this way. I'm going to set the smaller one aside and work just with the larger one for right now. I'm getting the excess liquid out. You don't have to go crazy. This one has a really pretty color coloration to it. Just fold it out so you can see. How lovely. And I'm laying them opposite. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to start at the end and I am going to roll my towel up. This is just going to help me take out the excess water and liquid. And I am going to gently squeeze it as I go. little roll of the skin here. I'll leave it for a couple of minutes. And the next phase of this is to just take, you can do um, a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag. And you can, if you wish, you can immediately start to tan, or excuse me, um, stretch and oil your skins. But I'm going to do another step, which is called frost tanning. And this is the process of using freezing to expedite the softening process. It helps to break down the cells. So I'm going to unroll this. And it's July. It's currently 80 something degrees out and there's no frost to be found anywhere. So we are going to stick this in the freezer. And I will take the skins and carefully fold them. Now that I've gotten all the excess water out, you can see how lovely they are. I'm very excited for these. And I'm going to just roll them in a loose roll. like that. From smallest, the tail end, to the largest. Put them in a plastic bag and stick them in the freezer. 
and I'm going to have them go through this process of freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing um, for a few hours. I would say um, we'll go about 24 to 48 hours of taking them out, putting them back in, taking them out, putting them back in. This is just going to help break down the membrane. So we'll check back in when the frost tanning process is complete. So here I have my fish skins drying after I took them out of the freezer. I put them in the freezer and took them out a few times over the course of a couple of days. And now I just have them drying here on my clothes drying rack right in the kitchen, just so the extra excess moisture gets removed before we start boiling. So with the skin here, you can see that it's soft and supple and it is mostly dry. I did not let it dry all the way, otherwise it would be rawhide. And it still has some flex and pliability to it. And I am taking bear grease. Yes, that's right. This is the rendered fat from a black bear, which I keep in my refrigerator. And I am adding it to the backside of the skin. And I'm just going to use the heat of my hand to work over the skin and move it in all different directions. So I'm spreading it just like you spread butter on toast and really getting the hide nice and lubricated. And what this is going to do is it's going to keep the skin soft and more towards a texture that is just like any type of leather you can purchase today. So nice and soft and I'm pushing it into the corners and the edges all on this underside of the skin. You can see that it's taking quite nicely and you can see the texture. So really working it back and forth using the skin to massage itself and I'll be flipping it over and doing the other side. And you can see I'll be adding more of this bare fat. And this is also going to give it a nice shine. And it's going to be rubbed in until it is pretty much completely absorbed. And so when you touch it, you will not feel the grease from the skin. You will just be touch touching soft leather. It's not going to leave any residue behind because this is the most labor intensive part. So working it in, really getting it worked into all of the, the pores and fibers of the skin, back and forth and back and forth. And so this takes the time that it takes. It could take 15 minutes, which it has in the past. It could take hours. Um, it really all depends on the thickness of the skin, the quality of tanning that you have done, um, and the fish itself. So you can see that I'm really, really working it in. And one of the techniques I like to use is using a soft or excuse me, a smooth stone to push it in or the palm of my hands. I will also use the side of the countertop, which is a sharper edge, just really pushing it into the skin and adding more grease to get it lubricated all over. And once this is absorbed, I'm going to finish it with a saddle soap or a leather conditioning soap and really just taking the saddle soap and working it in just as I'm working in the oils. So you work these oils in, you stretch the skin and you really massage it until everything is absorbed, until all of the bear grease is absorbed. And also so that the saddle soap is absorbed and you'll be able to see the finished product. After we used the bear grease to soften the hide, I then took some of the saddle soap and I continued to rub it in after the grease had dried. And now 
we have this beautiful soft fish leather which I will be using for making accessories um, and also earrings and part it will become part of my son's outfit nice and soft and supple thank you for joining us at the Half and Repper Museum to learn about fish skin tanning Pishkananamu. See you later.